Shabbat Shalom, everyone. Well, we're currently looking at uh, what I would call the most controversial commandment found anywhere in the Decalogue. Uh, in fact, uh, if you've been with us for the last couple of weeks, you know generation after generation after generation, all-out war has erupted in regard to this commandment. It's caused more debate, more controversy, more division, and even persecution. And again, I tell you, if, if I knew nothing else about what was going on, and I, could, I was on the outside looking in at Christianity and what was going on with the Sabbath, it would be enough for me to say, for whatever reason, the devil has this thing in his crosshairs. Why has this been the subject of so much debate? Why have Christians throughout the centuries clung to it and said, no, we need to keep this commandment of God. We need to fear God. And why do we have other Christians saying, no, you actually need to reject it or you're rejecting Christ. You're not serving him. You're putting yourself under bondage. And so you look at the history of this, it demands investigation, and that's what we're going to continue to do today. We're going to kind of do a little bit of uh, Sabbath apologetics, if you will, uh, specifically in regard to one passage found in the New Testament. It's a passage that uh, Paul brings to the table to the Romans, and it really serves as a premier defense for those Christians that want to come out and say, guess what? You as a Christian, you are not obligated to keep the Sabbath. And that passage I'm talking about is found in Romans chapter 14, verse 5, and this is what we read. One person esteems one day above another. Another esteems every day alike. Let each be fully convinced in his own mind. He who observes the day observes it to the Lord. And he who does not observe the day, to the Lord, he does not observe it. Traditionally speaking, this is a passage that many Christians will take you to, to say, don't make a big deal out of this. If I want to keep it, you know, I can. If I don't want to keep it, you know, not a big deal. You want to esteem every day alike, mazel tov. You don't want to identify with any day, no problem. We're all good. This is the passage that's used to defend that ideology. The question I have is this. Is this what Paul, is it what he's conveying? Is this the idea? Because the whole concept of when you go to Scripture is to extract the original intent of the authors. So as you go there, I just want to make sure I'm getting it. And so we're going to practice some good biblical exegesis today. Because to truly go in there responsibly, to read the Bible responsibly, you can't just go and read a verse and walk away and say, I, I, get, I totally get it. I got the divine download. I know what he's talking about. Because that's very dangerous. And that could put you in a very precarious situation. You know, a lot of people get very, very creative in those moments just at extracting one particular verse and creating an entire doctrine and theology out of it. So lest we do that, what do we need to do? We need to get some context. Good biblical exegesis will look at the broader context. Good biblical exegesis will look at the historical context. Good biblical exegesis will allow other testimony, other witnesses to be brought to the table to confirm, either confirm that how I'm reading this is correct or whether I'm misguided. I must be misunderstanding because I'm going to other parts of the Bible and it's actually contradicting what I am downloading. And so we're going to do, we're going to get into good biblical exegesis. And the first thing is let's get some context. And to do this, we got to go back to verse one. And so in verse one, we read the following, receive one who is weak in the faith. Now pay close attention. One particular group is in mind here, at least for now, in regard to to Paul, and he's given this particular group instructions. Their instructions, and what particular group am I talking about? I'm talking about those who are strong in the faith. They are developed in the faith. They are mature in the faith. They've been tested. Paul instructs them to receive one who is weak in the faith. To be weak in the faith, that means you're underdeveloped. You're not mature in the faith. 
Now you think about this, it kind of prompts a question, well, Daniel, what, what really determines who is strong in the faith? What really determines who is weak in the faith? It's fascinating that Paul actually already answered the question, if, if you were to chronologically go through the book of Romans, go back to chapter 10, and what does he say? Faith comes by hearing, and hearing by the word of God. Do you understand? You want to increase your faith? Start chewing on the word. Start receiving the word. The more you receive it, the more empowered you will become. The more you chew on his word, guess what? The more wisdom you will receive. The more understanding. Because this is the mind of God. This is the mind of Christ. And the more time you spend with his mind and his heart, you get this discernment. I mean, what what does it say in Hebrews? Again, Hebrews chapter 4, verse 12. The word of God is living and powerful, sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing the division of soul and spirit, joints and marrow. It is a discerner of thoughts and intents of the heart. It can do things you cannot do in the flesh. It has a power that you do not have on your own. And when you tap into that power, you yourself become empowered. According to his heart, according to his will, you get strong. And I get to go in there and I get to read about his promises I get, to, I get to know those. those. They start to become tangible. You know, you start to go through the scriptures and you start to see, man, when God says something, it comes to pass. When God promises people, hey, I'm going to bring you into the promised land. I'm going to take you out of Egypt by an outstretched hand, by many wonders. Guess what? You, you keep reading. It happened. And you, did, you discover that, oh my goodness, there's not a word that comes out of his mouth that returns to him void. It will accomplish the thing it's sent for. That builds my faith. I get strong. More and more, every page that I turn, I believe more in him. I believe in his word. These are the strong in faith. These are the ones that are well-versed. They've been in this intimate relationship with the Lord. And now Paul is instructing them, bear with the weak. The ones who are underdeveloped, the ones that don't, they're not as far in their journey as you are, Bear with them. And actually, that's literally what Paul would go on to say later on, uh, getting into chapter 15. We're to bear with the weak. Now he goes on and he says this. But not to disputes over doubtful things. You know, you look at this in the Greek, and, and a better way to say this would be the following. Don't bring harmful judgment upon their opinions. Watch yourselves. Use the discernment that God's given you. Be careful on how you're responding to the weak in faith. Well, now I ask the question, what is going on here? In Romans 14, why is it necessary to bring these instructions to the strong in the faith? He tells us in verse 2, check this out. For one believes he may eat all things, but he who is weak eats only vegetables. Okay, so let's dissect this. One believes, who is he talking about? The strong. The strong believes they can eat all things. So what does he mean by all things? It means they're omnivores. They're comfortable eating meat and vegetables. The the, the whole diet is all good. The weak and undeveloped in the faith, they don't believe that. Now here's the difference. I can tell you what the strong know. They know what the word of God says. They're confident in the word. And you go to the Torah, for example, Deuteronomy 12. It literally talks about the Lord. So he tells them, hey, when you come into the land that I'm going to give you, this beautiful promise I promised you, you may eat as much meat as your heart desires. Literally what it says. In fact, if you, if you, if you miss it, he says it again. He says it multiple times in that chapter. You may eat as much meat as your heart desires. This is what the strong knows. They're strong in the word. Unfortunately, not in everyone is there that knowledge. And so these weak ones are struggling. They're only eating vegetables. And it's one of the things that you need to know today. Please pay attention to what I'm about to share. Because you're going to miss the entire thing today if you don't get this. These, we'll call them vegetarians. These vegetarians are not vegetarians because they saw a documentary on Netflix. 
And it absolutely terrified them. I mean, how many people do you know they, they got on, they saw this documentary of the unsanitary conditions and the awful treatment of these animals, and it was just, it was awful. And people, literally an hour later, I'm a vegetarian. This has nothing to do, well, obviously with Netflix. It has nothing to do with health. Nothing. And if you don't get that component, if you're trying to read this through the lens of what you're experiencing today in in this modern America, you're going to totally miss the whole thing. This has everything to do with spiritual context. The reason these vegetarians are withholding from meat is because they see this in a spiritual context as something that would, could be their demise. And here's where you get into the historical context so you can see behind. It is important to note that across the spectrum, vegetarianism in a spiritual context was a very real thing in Paul's day, specifically. Even before Paul and long after Paul, for centuries following Paul, this was a big deal. I can tell you right now, you you think of different groups. I can tell you the Orphic cult. I can talk about branches of Zoroastrianism. We could talk about Manichaeism. We could talk about even the Greek philosopher Pythagoras. Loved his vegetables, totally abstained from meat. We could talk about the Roman philosopher Seneca. We can talk about Plutarch. I want you to understand something before we go further. In paganism... There were some pagans that very much to venerate their gods as an act and an expression of their worship and adoration to their fake gods, they abstained from eating meat. Now I ask you, let's get back into the first century in the historical context and we look at the reality of what is happening at that time. The gospel of Yeshua, a Jewish Messiah, a Jewish Messiah who came to Israel is now, through Messianic Jews, being spread throughout the world to who? Pagans, some of which absolutely clung to their vegetables. And I ask you, is it plausible that when these pagans, and we already know this is true just from the New Testament, is it possible that some of these pagans that are coming into the faith of Christianity this messianic Christianity, this this beautiful faith, is it possible that the way they were accustomed to their whole life, some of them their whole life, and worshiping and adoring their gods, for example, abstaining from meat, this is how they venerated their gods, is it possible that they're going to cling to some of this stuff as they come in and say, well, now I'm going to serve Yeshua of Nazareth? Absolutely. I mean, this is just a real thing. Now, if you've ever led someone to the Lord, you know it's a time of sanctification. It takes time. There are things you have to shed that you're used to, especially if you're coming out from a different faith, such as Islam, Buddhism. It's interesting. And so this is, this is something that you need to, to be aware of as we're looking at this passage, but I'm going to take it a step further. I want you to understand there were Christian Groups, not expect, Christian groups that absolutely held tightly to their veggies. They were not into eating meat for specifically spiritual reasons. And I'm going to give you some insight here so you can appreciate what Paul is talking about. And the first uh, commentary I want to share with you comes from Dr. Bart Ehrman, who's considered by many the foremost New Testament scholar in the world, which, as irony would have it, he's an agnostic. So don't go running to Mr. Ehrman's site to say, well, I'm, I'm going to get some good theology here. Um, he's, he's, th- that's not the guy. But he, the man knows his Greek, and he knows his church history well. His interpretation of some things, that's you know, less to be desired. I want to share with you what he has to say about a specific group known as the Ebionites. Okay? This was an early Jewish Christian group. Very important. This is what he says. Some of the Ebionites' distinctive concerns were embodied in their gospel. For example, since they believed that Yeshua's sacrifice on the cross had put an end to all animal sacrifice in fulfillment of the Mosaic law, they appear to have abstained from meat. In other words, translation, what Dr. Ehrman is is telling you is that the Ebionites were leveraging the awesome sacrifice of Yeshua. 
I mean, it's one sacrifice for all. And the sacrifices were to be done. If you've ever read the book of Hebrews, there's no more sacrifice. It's been, it is finished. The Ebionites were leveraging that reality to say, well, because what Christ did in doing away with the sacrifices, now that means no Christians are to eat meat. This is their mindset. Very, I would, I would add, very creative. Very creative. Now, continuing, because it looks like this is all paying homage to Yeshua, these early Jewish Christians. Their convictions on this score are evident in their gospel's account of the diet of John the Baptist, where the canonical statement that John ate locusts and wild honey is modified by the change of one letter so that now John the Baptist, in anticipation of the Ebionites themselves, maintains a strictly vegetarian cuisine, eating pancakes and wild honey. In other words, what Dr. I'll give you a backdrop to this statement. What they did is they took the Greek, which we're, we know the diet of John the Baptist was locusts and wild honey. That is the gospel's testimony. That doesn't work with Ebionite ideology because locusts were considered meat. And so locusts in the Greek is a crease. And so all they needed to do is slightly change the Greek to increase. And now he's not eating locusts. Now he's eating cakes. And now the world is just fine because now this lines up with their ideology. It lines up with their conviction. Do you understand that these early Jewish Christians were so serious about this diet of abstaining from meat that they were willing to change the word of God? Ever so slightly. Do you understand how passionate they were? The Apostle Paul does. He does. Let me put this into further perspective for you and introduce you to Epiphanius. Epiphanius was a radical apologist in the fourth, from the 4th century. And, and you've heard me say this before, but you know these early church fathers, when they came out against heretics, whether you're talking about uh, uh, Eusebius, whether you're talking about Tertullian, whether you're talking about Epiphanius, the gloves came off. They didn't have this whole cog of political correctness. They don't care who they offend. They don't care what you think about them. They come at it directly. Epiphanius is one of those guys, as you're going to see in a moment. He doesn't mince words. And he picks up, and actually the panari on this work, it's, it's just this litany of all these heretics and all these heresies, and he just goes off on each one, one of which is against the Ebionites. Listen to his words. He says this, And how can their stupidity about the eating of meat not be exposed out of hand? Tell me how you really feel, Epiphanius. <laughs> I, I do appreciate this aspect. I, I'm going to be on. I appreciate this straightforward nature of the early church fathers. He continues. He's going to give his, his assessment. First of all, because the Lord himself ate the Jewish Passover. Now, the Jewish Passover was a sheep and unleavened bread. Sheep's flesh roasted with fire and eaten. The Lord himself says, with desire, I have desired to eat this Passover with you. Just as a point of reference, Luke twenty-two fifteen, 15. It's right there. And he did not simply say Passover, but this Passover, so that no one could play with it in his own sense. A Passover, as I said, was meat roasted with fire and the rest. Verse 4. But to destroy deliberately the true passage, these people have altered its text, which is evident to everyone from the expressions that accompany it, and represented the disciples as saying, where wilt thou that we prepare for thee to eat the Passover? And supposedly, he, Yeshua supposedly saying, did I really desire to eat meat at this Passover with you? They're changing but how can their tampering go undetected when the message cries out that the mu and the eta, these are just two Greek letters, the mu and eta are additions. Instead of saying epithumia, epithumesa, which means with desire I have desired. He's quoting Luke 22. So epithumia, epithumesa, they have put in the additional, the mu and the eta. Christ truly said, 
With desire, I have desired to eat this Passover with you. But they misled themselves by writing in meat and making a false entry and saying, did I really want to eat meat with you at this Passover? But it is plainly demonstrated that he both kept the Passover and as I said, ate meat. And so here you have another example, again, of the Ebionites. They didn't just alter scripture to change the diet of John the Baptist. Now they're altering scripture to change Luke 22 and what Yeshua conveyed to his disciples to make it look like Yeshua is like, no, I'm not going to eat this Passover with you. I'm not going to eat meat. I'm telling you right now, this is how passionate certain groups. Now, this is a Christian group. This is how passionate they were about their vegetables. They had to start changing scriptures so that they could promote this belief. Let me give you a bonus. Epiphanius goes on and talks about another Jewish group known as the Nazareans. And this is what he says, just to give you an idea of how prevalent this was. And so, though they were Jews who kept all the Jewish observances, they would not offer sacrifice or eat meat In their eyes, it was unlawful to eat meat or make sacrifice with it. And so here's the point. As we come back to Romans 14, we're looking at 1 and 2. Understand what Paul is bringing to the table historically, moving into the historical context. Feel the weight of it. This is an issue. Absolutely an issue. You'd have an issue with some of the pagans who observe this kind of diet coming in, you have an issue of actually Christian groups that are adhering to this. And what I would say, religiously, to the point that they're willing to alter Scripture. And so rereading this, receive one who is weak in the faith, but not to disputes over doubtful things, for one believes he may eat all things, but he who is weak eats only vegetables. Now breaking new ground, verse 3. Let not him who eats despise him who does not eat. Again, Paul is, who is he instructing? He's instructing the mature, the learned, the well-versed in the word of God. He's instructing the strong in the faith. And specifically telling them, don't fall into the trap of despising your weak brother. Don't do that. And then he moves to instruct the weak in the faith. This is what he says. And let not him who does not eat judge him who eats, for God has received him. Incredible words. He's actually not done addressing them. He'll go on to say something, but before we we get into that, something that I need to point out, which this whole discussion today will never come full circle for you until you hear what I'm about to say. I want to ask a question. In regard to eating meat, is there anything prohibiting Torah in the Torah from people eating as much meat as they want? No, nothing, not at all. Let's jump to the other side for a second. Is there anything prohibiting those who are weak in the faith from not eating meat? Were were people commanded, no, you have to eat every day? Do you find anything like that in the Torah? No. No. You don't. You find certain circumstances with the priesthood. We know with the priests, the priests were to partake of the sacrifices, the chatat, the sin offering, the, the shalamim, you have the peace offering. There were a certain, uh, during the sacrifices that this would happen, yes, there would be eating of meat. But there is not a verse throughout the Torah, not in the prophets, telling people, on a regular basis, guess what, you have to eat meat. There's one exception for your general public. It would be the Passover itself. The Passover itself. Other than that, nobody's commanded to eat meat. So think about this situation. This is what's important. On one hand, you have those who eat as much meat as their heart desires. Nothing prohibited in the Torah. In other words, no sin. On the other hand, is the fact that you want to abstain from meat. Well, with all due respect, that's not sin in and of itself. You understand this situation? The dialogue in Romans 14 would be radically different if there was sin in the camp. Now, you can talk about the motives for abstaining from meat. And Paul does address this. You'll you'll see this. You can talk about the motives, and we can say, well, you know, there's some growth that needs to happen here. 
But these people abstaining from meat is not sin. And so carry that with you because you're going to need that in a moment. Now continuing on in verse 4. And this is to the weak in faith. Listen, because he just got done saying, you know, let not him who judge, uh, who does not eat, judge him who eats. Okay? He just got done saying that. He's still talking to these weak in faith. Who are you to judge another servant? To his own master, he stands or falls. Indeed, he will be made to stand, for God is able to make him stand. It's interesting. Paul takes a very strong position against the weak in faith and gives a very strong warning. Don't you judge them because they're doing, because they're eating meat. It's not sin. Check yourselves. Watch yourselves in this matter. And then we get to our passage in question. The passage reads, One person esteems one day above another. Another esteems every day alike. Let each be fully convinced in his own mind. This is the passage that today, from pulpits all across the world, that they're going to come out and say, see, this is proof. This is the proof text that Christians don't need to keep the Sabbath. What is the problem with that interpretation? Number one, please look at the passage carefully. Where do you even find the word Sabbath or any variation thereof? Do you see seventh day or Sabbath rest? Any idea of Sabbath? The word, it doesn't exist. It does not exist. That's the first problem. The second problem is context. What is the context? And again, I'm going to say this. Romans 14, from beginning to end and even going into 15, Paul doesn't even take a breath. It is all about food, eating and not eating. Period. And so you have a real problem when you look at the context. You have a real problem when you get into the historical context. Let me add this. What do the scholars have to say about this? Now, none of us will, you know, emphatically hang our hats on, you know, what the Christian scholars are talking about. But in regard to this discussion, it is important. Now, keep in mind, these are Christians that devote themselves to the study of the word. They're supposed to be the learned, the strong in the faith. Okay? What are they saying about this passage? Because if I didn't know better, because all these pulpits are filled with the exact same mantra that this passage is explicitly talking about the Sabbath. My guesstimation would be, this is what the scholars are teaching. Well, let's look at some commentary. This is going to fascinate you. This first commentary says, it is impossible, impossible to state definitely what days Paul has in mind. Think about the strength of that statement. Now, if, if, if you're one of those scholarly buffs and you like to read a lot of scholarly commentary, one thing you will know is scholars are very reserved in using strong terms. There's an art of discipline in being a scholar. To read something like this, it should hit you in the face. It's bold. It's impossible to state definitely what days Paul has in mind. He may, not is, he may be referring to the tendency of the Jewish Christians to continue to observe the Sabbath day. But he goes on. But it is also possible, also possible. Can we switch back? Get me back to that slide. But it is also possible that he is referring to special days which other groups felt must be observed for religious purposes. Isn't that fascinating? May be possible. Might mean this. And then What he started off with, it's actually, according to this particular scholar, his approach is, we just will never know. I don't necessarily agree with that concept that we'll never know because God preserved everything that he has preserved in his scripture is for his children to know. And we may not get everything, but at some point, you know what? We come to the revelation with with the gift of the Holy Spirit. Let me show you another commentary. This has often been taken to mean that the weak brother observes the Jewish Sabbath. Again, this is commentary on Romans 14, verse 5, explicitly. And this scholar recognizes what the mantra is coming from the pulpits. He knows this. This is what it's meant to take. We're dealing with the Jewish Sabbath. Look at what he says next. But Paul does not say this. This is a Christian scholar. He said, Paul doesn't say this. 
It's not there. And then he goes on, and it is equally possible that he is referring to feast days and fast days, either those laid down in the Jewish law or those derived from other sources. Some refer to lucky and unlucky days deriving from pagan life. You know, that last tidbit where there are some scholars who have come out and saying, well, this actually could refer to, uh, you know, because pagans are getting saved, they're coming into the faith, but then after a while, they go back and they start worshiping these days that were in honor of their God, these celebrations that were on specific days to honor their false gods, they start going back to that. When you read, and other scholars have dismissed this right off the bat, Uh, Many scholars actually have dismissed that whole idea simply because of what Paul says. Let each be fully convinced in their own mind. There's no justification. Paul would never justify by returning to pagan ways. Wouldn't do it. And so even Christian scholars recognize that that's total nonsense. This particular scholar is simply bringing it out because he knows some scholars have brought it to the table. Let me show you another commentary. One more. We could do this all day, but I'm going to show you one more. Again, since the very subject of foods to which Paul made reference in verses 2 through 4, this scholar recognizes this is about food, brings up that of fasting. It has been suggested that the apostle is here referring to days of fasting after the manner indicated in Luke 18, 12. And I'm going to tell you, he's absolutely right. He's not the only scholar declaring this. There are scholars that are looking at this, and they recognize the context is about food, and the only thing that Paul could really be talking about is fasting. And I'm going to tell you right now, absolutely fundamentally correct. This entire chapter is all about food. It's about eating and not eating. And now, Paul, where he started off over here, he started to talk about your omnivores versus your vegetarians. He has this issue, which is why he's written Romans 14. And now, he jumps into fasting. Why? What does Paul, why does he bring this to the table? He does it because he's seeking to bring greater clarity and understanding to the issue that he's dealing with. I want you to think about what I just said, because it will make more sense as we go on. And to help you understand where Paul is coming from and the point I'm trying to make, I want to give you a little backdrop. Let's get some historical context on fasting. And you're going to, I think you're going to appreciate this. In Luke 18, verse 11, the Pharisee stood and prayed thus with himself, God, I thank you that I am not like other um, men, extortioners, unjust, adulterers, and even as his tax collector. I fast twice a week. I give tithes of all that I possess. Now, I'm going to tell you something. I don't, I'm not going down the road of this guy was puffing himself up, bless you. I'm not going to go down the road that, you know, Yeshua is going to rebuke him because he's come before him to boast in his works before the Lord. That's insane. What I do want you to focus on is the fact that fasting was an intimate part of the faith. It was a massive expression in the faith. It was ingrained in the faith. And you might say, well, Daniel, this is a Pharisee. Well, hold on a second. When Yeshua is confronted But the disciples of John, they're upset. Oh, your disciples don't fast. He actually says, well, the time is coming. The bridegroom's going to be taken, and then they will fast. Yeshua, he predicts that, guess what? My disciples, those who follow me, those who hear the shepherd's voice, they are going to fast. And just read 2 Corinthians, and what do you read Paul say? I am in fastings often. Why is it that Yeshua actually gives a prescription in Matthew 6 to fast? Because I am telling you right now, this is one of the primary expressions of the faith. And here's my point. When you're in modern day evangelical Christianity today, and one of the primary expressions of the faith, has not, it's, not, it's not fasting. You will come to Romans 14, and you don't even have the thought of fasting. It's not even part of your faith. That's why you can start reading and playing with this in a totally different context. It's amazing to me. But let me push forward here, and I'm going to take you to Matthew 9. 
Then the disciples of John came to Yeshua, what I was just referring to, saying, why do we and the Pharisees fast often, but your disciples do not fast? Think about that statement. Think carefully. Judgment. Pay attention. Judgment is being shot across the bow from John's disciples, who are men of God. And they're casting judgment because they're looking at the disciples of Yeshua who are out there eating and drinking. While the disciples of John, we're over here suffering. Judgment. Do you know when it comes to fasting, it's not appropriate to start shooting across the bow because someone is not fasting. Because, you know, there, there can be days that, you know what, I'm fasting. And maybe some of you are not, and you come in, and there you are, you know, eating your ice cream and your treats and your whatever in front of me. That's not a situation where I get to judge you and say, well, that's ridiculous. I'm over here suffering here. You're, you're eating all these treats in front of me. That's totally inappropriate. It's not appropriate at all. Let me take you back to the late first century, early second century Early Christian document known as the Didache, okay? Non-canonical, but this very valuable because this whole Didache, this thing was church order. This was, this was the commission to organize the church. If you, if you were to put this in the New Testament, which I wouldn't, but if you would, you would put this among the pastoral epistles. It's making sure that there's good community rule. And in this, it's fascinating, they pick up on the fasting, the issue of fasting, listen to what this says. But let not your fast coincide with those of the hypocrites. They fast on Monday and Thursday. So you must fast on Wednesday and Friday. Interesting, go back to Luke 18. Notice what the Pharisees said, I fast twice a week. The whole concept is, yes, the Pharisees were fasting on Monday and Thursday. These were the days. Now you have this particular community coming on the scene or whoever authored this, we don't know. But whoever the author was saying, don't do that. Don't, don't fast with the hypocrites. No, you need to fast on Wednesday and Friday. Now, here's the problem I have with this statement. There are times as a community we ask people to fast because we're doing spiritual warfare and that needs to be done. There is nothing in the Torah saying, nothing anywhere in Scripture mandating that you fast on Wednesday or Friday or Monday or Thursday or Tuesday, one day a week or three days a week. There's nothing. And yet, when you get back, you start seeing people start throwing out these commands to do this. And I want you to take this in. That's where judgment starts to come in. This is even using judgment. According to this, I can't fast on Monday if I want to fast on Monday. Judgment. Are you following me? Let's go back. And we're going to put this, we're going to, we're going to come full circle. One person esteems one day above another, every, uh, and another esteems every day alike. Let each be fully convinced in his own mind, understand something. Fasting, when you fast, you esteem the day. It is not the day you get to go golfing. It's not the day you go to the gym. It's the day you humble yourself before the Lord. So very much, it is your observance to the Lord. It is very special when you fast. Okay? But because I am fasting and you're not, look at what Paul is talking about. One person deserves it one day, another person every day. Like You may not fast at all. Well, I fast twice a week. Should there be judgment passed going back and forth? And I want you to understand, this was a real thing. This was ingrained in the faith early on. Here's my point. The question becomes, Paul's talking about this whole issue of eating and not eating meat and vegetables. Look at the brilliance of the Apostle Paul and what he does. To help them understand his point, he brings something tangible to every one of them. This is mind-blowing. He brings something that they can all hold on in regard to those who fast and those who don't. And we know nothing, just like this issue over here between your meatitarians and your vegetarians, there is nothing in Torah on either side of this prohibiting or forcing them to fast. And isn't that interesting? This is a situation where he's bringing it on the table and say, look at the fasting. There's not to be any judgment in fasting. 
whether you fast or don't fast. Therefore, learn from that and understand there should be no judgment in regard to you if you want to eat me or if you don't. Absolutely mind-blowing. This is Paul at his best. For him to do this, it, it, it is incredible to me to see how prolific of a teacher he is. And uh, he, he'll, he'll school you every day of the week when you read because it's inspiration of the Holy Spirit, how he lays this out. And going to verse 6, he who observes the day observes it to the Lord. This is talking about fasting. And he who does not observe the day, well, to the Lord he does not observe it. Let's not get involved in judgment. And then he says this. This is miraculous because he takes these two issues of eating, eating meat and not eating meat and the fasting and not fasting, and he literally comes to a head and he speaks to both of these issues in one verse, and he says, he who eats, eats to the Lord. Meaning whether you fast or don't fast, whether you eat meat or you don't. He who eats, eats to the Lord, for he gives God thanks, and he who does not eat to the Lord, he does not eat, and he gives God thanks. I give God thanks for the brilliance of Paul. But I'm going to tell you, you can read, I don't care how many times you read Romans 14, you will find nothing, not a fragment, not a sentence about the Sabbath. And so we're going to close here.